This program is brought to you by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu. Okay, what I wanted to do today is to uh, talk about Barack Obama and to use his life as a way of talking about some of the themes in this class uh, that we've discussed uh, since the, the beginning. Now, um, I'm, I'm using him as, as a way of talking about larger ideas. So uh, it's, it's not, what I'm interested in is less what are his policies, what is the, the platform that he's running on for president and, and all of those kinds of questions, and more what does he represent in terms of a um, new direction in African American history. Um, is, is his campaign as significant, say, as the Jesse Jackson campaigns of the 1980s? Uh, probably not. Um, probably uh, in terms of the, the history books, unless he wins, uh, it'll be simply another stage that Jesse Jackson kind of pushed forward in the 1980s of, of what would be the role of a black candidate for president and how did you how are you taken seriously? Um, there's other aspects, though, of the Obama story, which I think do relate to these broader themes in this class, and I'd just like to touch on them. One of the ways of starting would be just to kind of go over the basic details of Obama's life story as he has told it on various occasions. One, one of the things that I think we know from looking at autobiography, the King autobiography, uh, the Malcolm autobiography, is that there's a bit of fiction in autobiography. That uh, a person makes up, if you were going to tell your life story, are you going to tell every detail of the life story? Are you going to tell <clears throat> those aspects of your life that convey your own sense of yourself, your own identity? Um, probably it's the latter, that you're going to to choose those details that make up a beginning and a middle and the end that is you that you want to portray to whoever is listening to your life story, whether it's a five-minute life story or an autobiography as a life story. What that means is that it's a fiction. It's, it's a, and it's a fiction we know from African-American history. It, it depends on who's telling it and when. With uh, Frederick Douglass, he told, he wrote his life story three times, and each of them were different life stories. Um, with uh, Malcolm X, the fact that he was telling it with Alex Haley made a difference in terms of the book that resulted. He was also talking to another person. He was, he was saying, well, I'm telling you my life story. Well, so we might have had two autobiographies of, of Malcolm X coming out around the same time, and then he was a young person, so he Ten years later, he might have written another one. Would have might have been the anti-Alex Haley life story of, of Malcolm X. And, and in all of this, what we see is that for someone like Obama, particularly as a political leader, he wants to tell a story. For, for Jesse Jackson, it was the story of somebody who came from humble beginnings as an illegitimate child who nonetheless rose to great success through uh, force of effort. Now, that's a classic American story. With the Obama story, it's someone who is looking for his identity. Um, this is the, the description on the, on the back of, of his book, Dreams of My Father. In this lyrical, unsentimental, and compelling memoir, the son of a black African father and a white American mother searches for a workable meaning to his life as a black American. It begins in New York where Barack Obama learns that his father, a figure he knows more as a myth than a man, has been killed in a car accident. This sudden death inspires an emotional odyssey, first to a small town in Kansas, from which he traces the migration of his mother's family to Hawaii, and then to Kenya, where he meets the African side of his family, confronts the bitter truth of his father's life, and at last reconciles his divided inheritance. A great story. Now, how many of you heard Obama in, uh, when he first came to real national prominence 
in the 2004 uh, presidential campaign and he delivered his address at the National Convention. Mm, maybe half of you heard that speech. It, it, was, it was a compelling speech and in fact I don't think he would be running uh, for president today if not for that, for that speech. For those of you who did hear it, what did you gain from his, because he, he made his biography a large part of his presentation of what he stood for as a politician. Uh, any, any memories of that? Yes? As someone who seems genuinely interested in, in nonpartisanship in Washington. Okay. Okay, uh, nonpartisanship, getting beyond the political divides, the, the uh, rancor in, in political life. Now, how is that tied to his biography? How, how does he tie that together? If, if, the, if the child makes the man, if, if, the, if the formative experiences produce the candidate, Obama, what, what does he see as crucial to creating the, the type of politician he will be, which is different from other politicians? What about it? Anyone? Well, what, what is your image of him? Is it, is it um, whether you agree with him as a politician or disagree with him as a politician, what makes him distinctive? He um, gave a, I, I watched on YouTube, uh, he gave a talk on religion. Mm -hmm. um, I thought it was really, um, he just seems like a really well-educated person and, um, you know, he definitely talked about nonpartisanship and just, um, like, I think he makes what he stands for pretty clear and, you know, he talks about his Christian faith and the context of living in a pluralistic society. Um, and um, you know, also just his his views being a Christian are, I guess they're they're not contradictory, but they're different from you know diff other Christians. Um, and he he talks about I don't know if it was Pat Robertson or somebody, but told him he wasn't a Christian um, because of uh, you know his political views. And um, so I mean, I was just you know watching his response, and I just, I, I okay. okay, well, one of the things that, that, that I would think would be part, part of his presentation of himself, and, and it comes through in, in terms of the way he describes himself, he's, he's, not, he's not part of this division between, between uh, the kind of uh, Christian right and the mainstream of Christianity. He doesn't want to get into that argument. He doesn't feel that the arguments that grew out of the 1960s between the right and the left in American politics, that they don't apply to him, that he was just a child. He was just born in the 60s. He wasn't formed in the 60s. Uh, so part of it is that his life story as a person who brings together black and white in America represents a reconciliation, that his own personal reconciliation with his heritage is part of what he sees as America coming to a reconciliation of, of these divisions, racial divisions, um, uh, religious divisions, other kinds of divisions, that uh, ideological divisions, that he sees himself as, as transcending those divisions because he's been able to transcend it in his own, in his own lifetime. Yes? <coughs> Sorry, he quotes a lot of um, he quotes King often, and like I saw I saw him speak that way, and uh, he was saying how when he quoted King previously, um, a bunch of you know like news channels and stuff had brought up that uh, that Obama does a really good job of citing African American history, and by when he talks about the civil rights movement and stuff in speeches, and his like reaction to that was saying that that isn't just African American history, that's American history, and that, um, you know, like to, to single it out as not being the history of everybody, and this is something that is the history of everybody, that, um, like of America as a whole. And I think that that ties in exactly with the fact that he, you know, grew up black and white family, uh, you know, with a white mother and all of this yeah. stuff, and he kind of used it as 
Yeah, his speech was kind of color-coded. He was saying, you know, I'm black, I'm white, America's divided, red states, blue states, you know, we're not, we're not either. You know, that, that all of these, these are phony divisions that, um, that can be transcended. And part of what his campaign represents is that. Now that search for his identity, for that search, that self-discovery that you see taking place in, in the book, that too has a lot of resonance with African American history. Um, can you think of other, you know, certainly the, the Harlem Renaissance represented that, uh, the, the effort on the part of black writers going back to that period and even before represented that, that Black literature, in, in some sense, is that sense of how do you identify yourself as black. Uh, and that's problematic. If it was given, you wouldn't have a literature. But what is Du Bois writing about in Souls of Black Folk? That African Americans sort of like have a, there's a <coughs> sort of like double identity. You, you're African American, you're, 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 you're like black, but you also have to, you're also American, so it's kind of like a. Yeah. A so he so he divides it as African uh, African American versus American, and of course his own racial background is also um, uh, interracial. Um, so with Obama, then, we can see this literature going from the Harlem Renaissance, um, the autobiography of Malcolm X is also a story of racial discovery. Uh, Roots during the 1970s is also Alex Haley's book. And in some ways, there's a similarity. What's the similarity? How many of you have read Roots? What, what happens in terms of Alex Haley's search for his roots? Okay, he goes back to Africa to find out where he came from. What does Obama do in his life story? He goes back to Kenya to find out about his father. And it's, uh, for him though, for Alex Haley, what's the, what's the difference in the, in the two stories? It's more of a historical journey because I mean, nobody in his immediate family is from Africa. Okay. Is, is, the, is there, for Alex Haley, it's tracing his family roots back to a village, going back to that village, but by that time, there's no one there who basically, you know, he, he meets a, a griot who tells him the story about this person who was taken away from the village many, many years before. So he, he has this sense of closure. Uh, for those, how many of you have read the Obama book? What? Oh, no, the, the uh, Dreams of My Father. Um, you have? I read, I read, I don't remember how it came to, I didn't read the whole thing. Okay. Well, so you didn't get to the, the climax of the story. In Obama's life story, it's not as well resolved because he grows up with an image of his father. What happens is that his father comes from Kenya. He's the first black student of uh, first African student to ever go to the University of Hawaii. Uh, he arrives there in 1959 uh, with help from the people at home who send um, help send him there so he can get training, bring back skills uh, to Africa. Uh, once he's there, he meets this uh, woman who is described by Obama as shy, awkward, um, uh, young white woman from Kansas who's, who's going there. They fall in love. Um, they get married. He then gets a scholarship, a graduate, um, gets admitted to a graduate program at Harvard. Because of finances, he has to go by himself. He goes back to, by himself. They never connect. Uh, Obama's father leaves when he's only two years old. He goes back to Kenya. That's the last he sees. He sees him briefly when he's about 10 years old. But he grows up with his father absent. And this, this kind of idyllic tale of these two people um, beating, falling in love, he's, he's the result of that. 
but he doesn't have any connection with his father. And a lot of his story is driven by by that. Um, when he when he tells his story, it's clear that that the absence of his father is the driving emotional force for his life. That he has a troubled uh, not not so you know when you look back at it, it's not so troubled, but he does. Uh, lead to a kind of acting out, um, dabbles uh, with marijuana, and, um, cocaine even, um, has uh, some problems of adjustment, but clearly not enough to prevent him from uh, getting a degree, going off to Harvard Law School, getting on law review, and you know, a few things like that. So it wasn't anything that was going to deny him getting ahead but it's an unresolved. Hi, Clarence. Hi, how are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to make it quiet. <laughs> Clarence, you can, Clarence, Clarence, you cannot make a quiet entrance. <laughs> so, so in any case, he um, when when he gets to when he gets comes of age and um, learns of his father's death in a car accident in Kenya, that provides an opportunity for him to resolve this issue and to come to terms with his identity. Is he a black black person? Um, he's been raised by his mother and by his grandparents, white. He's been raised in Hawaii where um, the black presence is certainly a lot less. So he has to come to terms with what does it mean to be a black person. And he feels that he can resolve this by going to Kenya, trying to find out the truth of his, of his roots. Unlike Alex Haley, though, he finds that once he arrives in Kenya, the story becomes much more complex. Um, what happens is that he finds out his father on the Kenyan side, has two other wives. That um, he had a wife before he went to the United States um, and met his mother. Apparently, she did not know about uh, his wife in, in Kenya, but they knew about his wife in America. And he, um, when he comes back, he remarries again. And um, he also finds out that his father was not simply the, the person who was told about in the family stories, this highly intelligent, very cultured uh, Kenyan who came to uh, Hawaii, but, all, but a person who was very troubled himself, um, troubled uh, alcoholism late in his life, someone who was abusive uh, to his, his other wives, um, someone who was not the, the same person that he had been he had created in his own mind. So he arrives in Africa and he finds out that his own life story is much more complex. Therefore, his own identity as a black person is much more complex. Um, one of the things that, uh, one of the passages that I think really represent uh, this dilemma is when he encounters his half-brother. Uh, when his father went back, he had another, another child who also came to the United States and happened to go to Stanford. Um, studied physics here. And this brother Mark, unlike Obama, was faced with the same dilemma, that is, how do I make sense? Because his, his mother in Kenya was also white. So he comes and to the United States and, and what Obama finds in meeting this person who is almost his twin in some ways. I mean, a highly intelligent, going to an elite university in the United States um, uh, from a biracial background, same father. Uh, so how are they going to make sense of this dilemma? So in, in the book, there's this passage 
when he meets this brother in Kenya and they and he decides says so Mark I said turning to my brother I hear you're at Berkeley Stanford he corrected his voice was deep his accent perfectly American I'm in my last year of the physics program there then he then he arranges to meet him privately for lunch so that they can talk I asked him how it felt being back for the summer fine it's nice to see my mom and dad of course as for the rest of Kenya I don't feel much of an attachment just another poor African country you don't ever think of about settling here uh, Mark took a sip from his coke no he said I mean there's not much work for a physicist is there in a country where the average person doesn't have a telephone Um, and then Obama, um, Barack says, I should have stopped then, but something, the certainty in this brother's voice maybe, or a rough resemblance, like looking in a foggy mirror, made me want to push harder. I asked, don't you feel like you might be losing something? Mark put down his knife and fork, and for the first time that afternoon, his eyes looked straight into mine. I understand what you're getting at, he says flatly. He said flatly. You think that somehow I'm cut off from my roots, that sort of thing. He wiped his mouth and dropped the napkin onto his plate. Well, you're right. At a certain point, I made a decision not to think of, about who my real father was. He was dead to me even when he was still alive. I knew he was a drunk and showed no concern for his wife and children. That was enough. It made you mad? Not mad, just numb. And that doesn't bother you, being numb, I mean? Towards him, no. Other things move me. Beethoven symphonies, Shakespeare's sonnets. I know it's not what an African is supposed to care about, but who's to tell me what I should and shouldn't care about? Understand, I'm not ashamed of being half Kenyan. I just don't ask myself a lot of questions about what it all means, about who I really am, he shrugged. I don't know. Maybe I should. I can acknowledge the possibility that if I looked more carefully at myself, I would. For the briefest moment, this is Brock, I sense Mark hesitate like a rock climber losing his footing. Then almost immediately he regained his composure and waved for the check. Who knows, he said. What's certain is that I don't need the stress. Life's hard enough without all that excess baggage. Outside, we exchanged addresses and promised to write with a dishonesty that made my heart ache. Um, you know, it, it, it's an interesting encounter and you know, of course, from Barack's point of view, he's using it as an as a alternative to his determined suit, uh, search for his own identity. What else can you read into that conversation now? Who has the more realistic notion of, of Africa? It's his brother. His brother has spent far more time, knows his father, knows the family. Um, but... What else can you read into that? It's interesting. It gets the yeah. Um, I guess the Barack because he wasn't born and didn't have to live in Kenya um, is less disillusioned, and so probably <coughs> would care more about uplifting Africa than, than his brother, who yeah, I guess has had just see devastation every day and just wants to get away from it all. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the, the portrait that Barack, of course, it's Barack telling the story. It'd be interesting, I don't know if we have ever had the story told from Mark's point of view of, of what that conversation was like and what his life was like if he were writing the biography telling his fictional story about what, um, how, the, how he became the person he became. But in, certainly for Barack, he's using it as kind of a negative example of someone who has kind of lost touch with his roots. But it's, it's kind of a harsh portrait, and I wonder if, if it's all fair. I mean, it, it's, it's two people struggling in different ways to deal with their, the question of identity. One of them has to deal with knowing the reality about the father, the other person growing up with a myth, what he himself says is a mythological view of his father. Um, 
it's it's an interesting encounter because it's it's part of the encounter that I I think happens with African Americans and Africa. Um, it's it's a it's a story that we can see in uh, Richard Wright um, going back to going to Africa during the 1950s and writing about in you know fairly cynical terms about what he discovers once he gets to the African continent. Um, the, it's a book called Black Power, if you actually, it's one of the first uses of that term, Black Power, and it was written in the 1950s. Um, it's an interesting book, and it's one of the many narratives we have of African Americans going to Africa, trying to find their roots. Alex Haley is more of a romanticized view, because, of course, he doesn't have to deal with his real family. He deals with the descendants um, who have very little memory of the slave who was taken away uh, many centuries before. Well, yes? It just strikes me, uh, when I listen to it, especially the quote about Shakespeare and Mozart moves me, um, brutally honest, and that in a lot of novels or biographies or even in personal conversations where people have lived with family members struggling with addictions or toxic lives because of the conditions that they're <coughs> under and then how that gets oppressed or pushed onto their loved ones. It's, it's, it's very complex and not having enough information to say, you know, is this a blow under the belt, is this, no. because that could have been many black men of people that I knew, their fathers, of what the conditions were that they were living under and just trying to survive. It's, it's interesting for me in terms of, of looking at, uh, at the narrative of Barack going to Africa and that his experiences there. Um, one of the things that um, I did with my son, who um, um, right at when he finished it at Howard, um, one of the rewards was that, where do you want to go? And since he had taken Swahili at, uh, at Howard, he said, well, I want to go to Africa. And uh, so we packed up, went for three weeks in Kenya. And it, it was, in, in a sense, very similar in terms of, of I was looking at Barack's experience there, um, the way my son experienced Africa for the first time. Um, in, in a lot of similarities there, because I think for both of them, it was an answer to, there had been this question throughout their lives about what does it mean um, to grow up as a black person, in my son's case, growing up in Palo Alto, going to Palo Alto High with a white mother um, and encountering that need for self-identity and finding part of the answer in Africa, but finding that the answer that you get is much more complex than what you, what you thought you were going to get. And it was, uh, I think for Obama, one of the things I admire about this narrative is that it is quite honest about that, about how painful that experience was. It's interesting that he's portrayed in the media as a person who has himself kind of transcended race. And yet, when you read the narrative, what you find is that it is a very painful encounter with race throughout his life. Um, there's this assumption if you grow up in Hawaii, which has this image of, you know, no one cares about race in Hawaii, everyone's kind of sunburned anyway, so. Um, but Hawaii, what he describes is a much more complex experience growing up, partly there and partly in Indonesia, of an encounter with all the various complexities of racial, ethnic, cultural differences. Um, maybe this would be the best time. To, I found another passage in the, in the book, which I thought uh, it would be good to have a Wele read. And this is an encounter uh, that uh, Obama has with a 
a relative of his who um, is a uh, historian in Kenya. So she has, she's able to look at this dilemma of African Americans and Africans, and uh, maybe you could read that, that passage. You know, young black Americans tend to romanticize Africa so. When your father and I were young, it was just the opposite. We expected to find all the answers in America, Harlem, Chicago, Langston Hughes and James Baldwin. That's where we draw inspiration. And the Kennedys, they were very popular. The chance to study in America was very important, a hopeful time. Of course, when we returned, we realized that our education did not always serve us so well, or the people who had sent us. There was all this messy history to deal with. I asked her why she thought black Americans were prone to disappointment when they visited Africa. She shook her head and smiled. Because they come here looking for the authentic, she said. That is bound to disappoint a person. Look at this meal we're eating. Many people will tell you that the Luo are a fish-eating people. But that was not true for all Luo. It was not always true. Before they settled around the lat, they were pastoralist, like the Maasai. Now, if you and your sister behave yourself and eat a proper share of this food, I will offer you tea. The Kenyans are very boastful about the quality of their tea, you notice. But, of course, we got this habit from the English. Our ancestors did not drink such a thing. There is the spices we use to cook this fish. They originally came from India or Indonesia. So even in this simple meal, you will find it very difficult to be authentic, although the meal is certainly African. Rukia rolled a ball of ugali in her hand and dipped it into her stew. You can hardly blame black Americans, of course, for wanting an unblemished past. After the cruelties they've suffered, still suffer from what I read in the newspapers. They're not unique in this desire. The European wants the same thing. They, German, the English, they all claim Athens and Rome as their own, when in fact their ancestors helped destroy classical culture. But that happened so long ago. So their task is easier. In their schools, you rarely hear about the misery of European peasants throughout most of recorded history, the corruption and exploitation of the Industrial Revolution, the senseless tribal wars. It's shameful how the Europeans treated their own, much less colored peoples. So this idea about the golden age in Africa before the white man came seems only natural. A corrective, Amma said. Truth is, usually the best corrective, Rukia said with a smile. You know, sometimes I think the worst thing that colonial, colonialism did was cloud our view of our past. Without the white man, we might be able to make better use of our history. We might look at some of our former practices and decide they were worth preserving. Others we might grow out of. Unfortunately, the white man has made us very defensive. We end up clinging to all sorts of things that have outlived their usefulness. Polygamy, collective land ownership. These things worked well in their time, but now they most often become tools for abuse by men, by governments, and yet, if you say these things, you've been infected by Western ideology. So that's another um, passage from the book that I think is, is, is part of this um, interesting issue, which I think is um, part of the last chapter in the textbook. Um, you know, when I was made this determination early in writing the textbook that I was going to bring it up to the present, and uh, um, that was part of the frustration I had. I think I might have mentioned this earlier in the class um, that when I was going to uh, take history classes uh, in college or in high school, they would always, the, the book would always end right when it got interesting for me, you know, right when it got to when I was born and my life and, and all of the courts. And I was just determined that I was not going to do that. But, um, and I got no support from the publisher, by the way. Their, their, their view was that um, no one teaches this stuff. You're, you're, you're going to write these chapters on the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Um, but none of the people using the textbook are actually going to teach it. They'll stop in the 60s because that's where uh, most African American history courses end. Uh, but, you know, since they needed me and um, <laughs> to write the textbook, I said, okay, you know, here it is and you better publish it. And they did. And I, I found talking with other, other people that it's usually not taught. But when we get to the 90s, the question really comes, what is the theme? 
every earlier chapter, you can see, I mean, I, I, I try to find themes and the literature is still developing for the 70s. What was the, what was the theme? It was kind of the, um, this transition from the politics of the 60s to a new forms of politics, the, the rise of black elected officials, the black, rise of black feminism. Um, in, the, in the 1980s, you see um, these themes kind of working it out in terms of gender issues coming to the fore. By the 1990s, it, it seemed to me clear that the major theme was identity, that that was what was driving most of, of the discussion. Is there an African-American community? What does it mean to be black in the 1990s? Um, it's, it, and just recently, the Pew uh, Foundation did a survey of African-Americans. I don't know if any of you have read the accounts of it, but one of the findings was they asked the question, do African-Americans constitute a single race? And they asked black people this question. They have asked it before, but now for the first time, most African-Americans said that the divisions within the black community were more important than the things that held African-Americans together, class divisions, other things. I think it was, it was like 50-some percent um, agreed with that statement. That was seen as, as significant. Um, I think that you can see it in the literature during the time. The, the best-selling book having to do with racial identity uh, published in the 1990s was, was not uh, um, Content of Our Character by uh, Shelby Steele. It was, it was not Race Matters by Cornell West. It was The Color of Water, a book about a a black man story of growing up with a Jewish mother in New York. Um, what, does, what does this represent? It's, it's one example there um, when we look at the films of Spike Lee, the kinds of issues that he has dealt with in the 1990s, a lot of it has to do with the question of the search for identity um, and the complexity of identity within the black community. Um, when we look at Obama then, I think that it is, if Obama didn't exist, we would almost have to create him as a, as a public figure. And in fact, to some degree, we did with Tiger Woods. Um, and there's been a number of people who have made the connection with Tiger Woods as, as the, the person who, is, as a public figure represents this complex new identity. Uh, just a few years ago on, on the Stanford campus, there was a conference on race. And in the book, I mention um, John Hope Franklin and his dialogue about race that went on in the 1980s. Um, and the conference at Stanford was to some extent an extension of that discussion that John Hope Franklin had started. He was invited to give the keynote speech here at Stanford. And in both cases, both the John Hope Franklin effort, which was initiated by Bill Clinton, a national dialogue about race, and the Stanford conference came under attack because the feeling was that the peop people in charge of these efforts saw race as dichotomous, as a black-white issue. And John Hope Franklin was, was criticized for the way in which the hearings and the discussions around the nation, now he responded to this, and I think that it changed over time, of understanding that race has become much more complex in the 1990s. That um, in American society, the, the largest ethnic group is not black Americans, but Latino Americans, uh, which within the Latino community, there is lots of diversity, uh, many of them black as well. Um, there, the notion of race 
being something that can be defined in the dichotomous terms that existed before um, is, is something that was being challenged. And I think uh, by the time of the Stanford campus uh, uh, conference, there was an attempt to try to represent the reality, racial reality of California. Now, one, one of the ways in which I would dramatize this, though, is to ask a question about this class. This class is based around the assumption that there is an African-American history. And we can see, looking back, that there's much to that idea, because for most of American history, African-Americans have been defined as a group, have been oppressed as a group, and the struggle to overcome that oppression has been the basic theme in African-American history. Uh, what is the title of the textbook? The Struggle for Freedom. That that provides the, the basic thematic thread that runs through this entire story called African-American history. The question I would ask to you is, does that story continue into the 21st century? Is there a common thread to kind of respond to the Pew finding? Is there any common thread that makes the story of African American history coherent? Or have we reached the end of African American history? That we have history and we have people like Barack Obama running for president, but is that an African American story? Or are we basically talking about people who no longer face, you know, if Du Bois were here writing Souls of Black Folk today, would he have the same analysis of this divided mind, divided between American identity and African American identity, and that being seen as his theme, um, is that still the way we should see African American history um, when we get to the 20s? You know, second century, and they look back. Is there, will there be a textbook that will trace African Americans through the 21st century, or will we simply be part of the American story? Um, I'm simply raising it as as a question, and it became a pressing question to me when I asked myself after, um, as we got get into the 21st century. What events would be part of my chapter for the, the last 10 years, say, past since the Million Man March, um, since the, about the period of, of uh, two, uh, 1997 to the present? If I were going to sit down and write a chapter and say, what constitutes the last decade of African American history? I throw that out to you because in this case, unlike, <laughs> unlike the rest of the rest of this class, you have as much source material to work with as I do. This is part of your biography. Uh, how do you define it? Uh, do you still see yourself as being part of this African-American experience? If it is, is it still a freedom struggle? Yes, yes you. Um, there is there's a lot different in the fact that I guess it would be more about like almost the like commercialization of blackness or like the being like black being a commodity in the history of that. What I was mentioning yesterday about performing or I guess on Tuesday about performing black as opposed to being black, that there's there is a distinction to be made. Um, and the way in which certain things, we live in a very commercialized, cap capitalistic society that the culture is another commodity that is bought and sold and, and used to sell things. Um, you know, why, why do we, you know, one of the reasons why we have uh, black people on television is that now it helps sell things. It helps sell uh, things that, why is Tiger Woods, he sells a lot of things on television. Um, 
What? Yes, right, yeah. You know, it's interesting. When I when I went to UCLA in the in the 60s, I worked at Columbia Pictures, and, and my job was working in advertising research. And it was just at the time when they were beginning to uh, introduce uh, black people into commercials. There, you know, there was a time when there was no black person ever in a commercial on television. Okay, so it was around the, the mid 1960s that they were trying to make this decision: Could you have black people actually sell things? Okay, and what they would do is they would make the same commercial, and we're, we're not talking about the star of the commercial. We're talking about having a black person in the commercial. Um, and they would make the same commercial with a white cast, and then they would have one black person in the commercial. And then at, at Preview House on Sunset Boulevard in L.A., I think it's still there, um, people would go and they would have these uh, little machines and, and mm -hmm. they would give their immediate response to the commercial. And then they would answer questions about whether, you know, how they would respond to the commercial. And what we found is that um, mm -hmm. the immediate response was a very emotional response. That, black, that the people watching the commercials, black and white, would respond with shock to see a black person in the commercial. And, but it was gradually beginning to, you know, the shock did not necessarily mean that they wouldn't buy cigarettes. You know, <laughs> that was back in the day when you could advertise cigarettes. Um, and it was a interesting process by which they decided it was safe enough to introduce a black person into the commercial. And gradually, now of course, it's, it's almost, you know, you don't really think about it that much. Tiger Woods can sell probably as much as anybody else. Um, O.J. Simpson was probably the breakthrough person in that, by the way. Uh, the first person that white America learned to trust <laughs> uh, uh, enough to to buy the products that he was he was hawking. Uh, so, um, uh, and and in fact, it's, it's you know you smile at that, but O.J. Simpson was the Tiger Woods of the of the 1980s. So, what does this represent? You know, have uh, now have we become so part, much a part of the fabric? of American society, does it doesn't make much sense to tell a different story? Maybe in about another 20 years? Yes. You're, okay, I'm, I'm glad somebody is making an argument. I'm not going to go out of business. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to hear, like, on my computer, like, marking all those things. Yeah. I heard him say Katrina for, like, one of the things. Okay, Katrina. Yeah. It, it was kind of a good reminder that as Carnell West says, race matters. Mm -hmm. Of course, one of the things about the Pew thing is that they said that, was it race matters or was it class matters? Mm -hmm. I think that race and class are tied together, but I don't think that that like, eliminates the conversation about race. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so what do you see as, as the distinctive race element that still is part of the story of American history. Yes? Well, I think one of the most salient would be the criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. and, uh, like how a lot of this discrimination that was overt has sort of uh, now manifested itself in the form of, of statutes that have disproportionate impact on people in uh, marginalized communities like black people. Well, I don't think that the Pew organization was saying that the story of the black poor doesn't exist anymore. It's just that those of you in this class are now disconnected with that. That, um, that that is a different story. That the people who are going to prison, the people who are in, um, the victims of Katrina, that that is no longer part. That is one story. Then there's the story 
Barack Obama, Tiger Woods. Uh, there is a story of success. There is a story of, of making it in American society. Uh, Condoleezza Rice. Um, is that <laughs> to mention another Stanford person? <laughs> you know, it, it is interesting. Uh, you know that uh, just just my own personal memory of, of Tiger Woods is that he was here for two years. I never had a Tiger Woods sighting, so uh, you know, I I don't know how he got through Stanford for two years without um, me ever encountering him. But that's a, <laughs> I, I I wouldn't put it that way. Uh, his, maybe 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 I was just on the wrong side of campus. At, yeah. But anyway, you were going to say. Um, yeah, I was going to say that I feel like the the African American struggle is still really relevant. Like just, I think in California and Stanford we get a little faded, but like where I'm from in South Carolina, like I overheard someone say like. With, when I was with my dad recently, that I don't want to vote for Hillary Clinton, but I'll be damned if I vote for a nigger. Like, verbatim, that's what someone said. So, no matter how Obama identifies himself, or like, you know, no matter how we, you know, as you know, a group of African Americans are identifying with him, there's a, a sector of the population that no matter what still thinks of him as a nigger. And because of that, I don't think that he's, you know, any, his, his challenges are any less or greater than Jesse Jackson. I don't think that's the same. What about the response of, of Mark Obama, you know, Brock's brother? What, what about the response of saying, yeah, I know all that, but am I going to get stressed about it? Am I going to allow that to, to ruin my life? Am I going to... You know, I'm going to get my Stanford degree. I'm going to go on and do my life, and it's it's a different story. You know, I can I can visit my relatives, but I'm not gonna I'm not going to allow that to drag me down. Isn't that the story that that's put forward by um, you know to some degree? I think um, we see that in in the kind of neoconservative literature of recognition that it's not a race thing, it's a class thing. But you're saying it, it's still race. It is. I mean... So, so the fact that that, the, that person could say that about Obama, who's Harvard-educated, um, you know, a law school professor, if, if he is still considered a nigger. And I would argue that... The unfortunate part about Obama is that I think he's very qualified to be President of the United States, considering who we have in office now. <laughs> but I think because he has, you know, the unfortunate, you know, stigma of his, the color of his skin being different than the, the current administration's president, that he's he's fighting a harder battle no matter what. So, you know, I, I just feel like you can't, like separate race no matter what because he's, I think, inherently fighting a harder battle than anybody else. In the back, yeah. Um, I think that what Bur Obama's brother said to a degree makes sense because his, his sort of approach um, sort of like, well, let's move on and sort of, you know, create, sorry, sort of what he's saying, whether he means to or not, is sort of create a new identity or create his own identity. But what strikes me about the, the current or from the future um, idea, like a, a civil rights struggle, a freedom movement. At this point, like I feel like so much of it is cultural, and so much of it is just it, it, it's a lot more subtle now. I think. You know, and it's it's no longer acceptable really for people to you know go out and shout from the rooftops that you know things that you know that would have been. That you know you, that we've seen throughout American history, um, but you know, like you know, I grew up in Chicago, and it's you know pretty fairly liberal, liberal place, and you know my high school was was pretty diverse, and, and you know I didn't really grow up seeing like, a lot of the a lot of those issues. Like it seemed like race wasn't so much of an issue at, at my high school, but then you know I I was at a, at a camp once with. There's some guys who lived a little farther north of me in a suburb that was mostly white. They referred to a Mexican kid as a spick. 
and just like offhand, it seemed like there, he didn't really have a problem with it. So the point where it sort of hit me, I was like, okay, well, this isn't the kind of thing that I think is going to, like, you know, confront America, like, you know, full on in the face anymore, but it's the kind of thing that's going to sort of linger and, and be, you know, underneath the, um, yeah. the, the mainstream. And I think that that creates a much more difficult problem because, you know, how do you attack that head on if it's something that it isn't, you know, like really right in the face of, of most of America? One of the things I've heard is the metaphor that uh, racism is like a weed that if you know if you don't keep stomping on it, it'll it'll just keep coming back. And I, I think of that. One of the things I did during this quarter, during the Thanksgiving um, holidays, went to um, Amsterdam and, and Brussels because I was invited to speak there at a number. Um, I've been doing a lot of that for the last two years since the riots in in France and either France. Uh, uh, Netherlands and Belgium are, are all now faced with issues which are, are racial, basically. Um, and they thought that they were beyond that, that there's a sense that, oh, uh, you know, that's something that American society has, but we've always assimilated people into our society and um, a but now we, we find these people who, they just don't want to assimilate. But that's the problem. That, uh, that it's nothing wrong with our society, but we just don't quite understand this new generation that's coming along. They just don't want to, to fit into it. And uh, so they're dealing with this, these problems, and there's this, these discussions that are going on that I find very familiar. Now, they come at it from a different historical perspective, but they thought that they were they had transcended that. Maybe now they're being reminded that a change in economic conditions. You know, for example, I, I traveled in, in uh, eastern um, eastern Germany, and there's a neo-Nazi movement that's very very strong that gets about 10, 15 percent of the vote. Um, that is very explicitly racial and anti-immigrant. Um, and that has resulted in riots against um, immigrant workers. So, you know, and this, is, and this is a society that once brought in, you know, these workers to be their guest workers. And, uh, but the question of what place do they have in the society is still unsettled. Yes? West used the example of catching a cab. Mm. That, that, the, that's, that's even very complex because, um, you know, when, when I would visit my son in, in, in Washington, the cab drivers who wouldn't take me to the Howard campus were often, in fact, most often, black. Um, so it's, you know, where, where do we fit into that? Um, yes. I think kind of building off of that, if, if you were to argue that it's, it's a class issue only now, then you would have to make the argument that there wasn't racism at Stanford, and that's clearly not true. Like that there weren't race issues on at Stanford, and there are. 
and um, like to say that the the elite is disconnected. That you know, like the Stanford educated or somebody that is disconnected and all those things would be to ignore the fact that there there still are there's a far away from the go. Well, another way of putting it, do, does the black middle class have a stake in the solution to these race problems? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. And what, what's that? Well, the black middle class isn't anywhere near as that like, the white middle class would. Okay. Just being a black middle class person doesn't give me the same amount of work as the way other people. So I feel like if you do, if you are a part of that movement and like how you feel like yeah. poor in general, anyway. It does, it does help you. One, one of the studies that came out just recently, um, some of you might have seen, uh, it was a study of, of the children of middle class people in the 1960s and what has happened to them in, in terms of wealth and, um, at, at present. Um, so it would be basically Obama's generation. And what they found was that white families are far more able to pass on wealth to their kids, even at the same income level. That is, one way of measuring it is just, you know, what, what is your income, but what is your wealth? Because income usually cannot be passed on to anybody. You spend it. <laughs> it's wealth that gets passed on, you know, usually in the form of a home or something like that. Yes? I'm wondering how much of this um it's occurred to the argument you brought up earlier about whether there's um, African American history or even like African American community in this. Um, and I was trying to place this in context of, of desegregation, of integration practices, and um, in doing so, the schooling and education um, field today, it feels like, um, pushes this integration type of method. So, what I was wondering is how much of that um, that integrated culture of um, of indi individualism in the U.S. Um, gets translated into the crumbling of the African American community as a, as, as a community as a whole. I guess um, because I see a lot more of um, I guess in my personal view like. People are out to get their own instead of helping a broader community. And the higher you get in um, the class-wise society, I guess, the more disconnected you are with the roots of that community that got you there. Um, so I was just kind of wondering how, how that fits in. I guess. Another theme of the Obama book when he gets back to Africa is his father was very generous with the family. And one of the points he makes consistently in terms of his discussion with people on the African side is how, how much there is a need. If someone goes to America and becomes successful, there are a dozen family members who think of that success as, well, you should help us. And there is that sense that if you allow that to happen, then you get dragged down. And part of the kind of sub-theme of the book is that that's what one of the things that happened with his father, mm. is that he, he was kind of pulled back by his sense of generosity. Mm -hmm. uh, Clarence, I was just kind of curious about just um, this discussion. You know, you've had a chance to, uh, I mean, in, in, in terms of your own experience, um, you're older than me, <laughs> so you've had a little bit of uh, of, of more experience in terms of, of the distinction between the 50s, say, when um, these issues, the question of whether you were black or not, or not is, was imposed from the outside. It wasn't, wasn't some journey of self-discovery. <laughs> you didn't have to journey very far to get the message of, of what your place was in American society. How do you see that being where we are now, where I think for a lot of younger people, it is a journey of, it, it is, there is a, a matter of choice um, that was just not available to an earlier generation. Yeah, I think that um, 
in your earlier comments, you were, I, I think you were so astute and you, I think, articulated really the profound issue of, uh, of our time. And that is, as you know, Dr. Du Bois said in the paraphrase, the challenge of the 20th century, the challenge of the color line. I mean, the challenge, therefore, so therefore, is the, therefore is the challenge of the 21st century, being able to make that transition <coughs> to a new, to a different society where the question of color per se will not be the defining factor. And I think that uh, 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 clearly, I remember a, a recent issue, maybe it was in the past year, of uh, Time magazine, in which they were talking about uh, the generation, and they, they had on the cover a kind of a composite of, uh, you know, there wasn't any such a black person or a Spanish a composite. And then you hear all, you hear the, you know, the, uh, the statisticians and the demographers say that by 2050, the other chief in the world here, that there won't be such a thing as a, as a black person or, or an African American because it will be such a, uh, a combination of so many races. Okay. There was no question of what you said before. We, my, my generation, and part of your generation, it was, it was the legacy of slavery and racism that defined who we were. The alpha, the, the racist structure said you were black. You know. Okay. And, and so my, and your generation, we came up with that. And so I think it's appropriate. Uh, in the book, how can you have the struggle for African American identity, for example, in the last part of the 20th century without being a struggle for freedom? Because that's what it is. The content of that struggle is a struggle for freedom. Uh, I think my experience on, in Wall Street is what influences what I'm about to say, however. And that is that. Um, you know, when you were talking about commercials, uh, blacks being in television, actually it was not a question of um, goodwill on the part of uh, the um, corporations and media companies. It was a sheer question of, of responding to the market research data that they got. So that, for example, classic example, when the liquor companies found yeah. out that approximately 12% of the population accounted for maybe 40% uh, of the scotch or 50% of the scotch <laughs> that was consumed in the United States. Or when the, um, 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 the people for Procter & Gamble found out that notwithstanding 12% of the population, that, that blacks consumed uh, 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 substantial amount of the product that they were advertising. Mm -hmm. So therefore, the, the, the smart people said, look, if you want to sell more products, you want to sell more, then you better put somebody in those commercials that the market we're trying to reach can identify. Right. So uh, it, it's not surprising when you look at a McDonald's commercial, for example. <laughs> when, you think about it, when, you have, when you look at a McDonald's commercial, <laughs> They have an Hispanic and they have a black and a woman and they're all dancing and they're doing all the current yeah. lifestyle <laughs> because they know, they, know, they, know, they know those are the people that are buying your products. Mm -hmm. all right? <laughs> I think that the challenge in the 21st century may indeed, may indeed be fundamentally economic. May indeed fundamentally be economic. You talked about something that was very poignant, though, when you talked about the transition of wealth between the white middle class and the black middle class. One of the problems that the black middle class parents have found is that in addition to their own struggle to accumulate wealth that they could pass on to their children, <coughs> is that their children going to Stanford and Harvard and Dartford and 
so forth, is that they are being pressured by this other huge tsunami tidal wave of rap music and culture, which in effect urges them to dumb down, urges them to be less of an intellect, uh, uh, sometimes being put in the language, well, acting white, you know, the classic poignant story to Bob Herbert writes from the New York Times, this very uh, black uh, woman, a girl, goes to Howard from forth and goes back home and, and she, she's told among her friends, but what happened to you? You know, you don't talk the same way. You, you're acting white, you know? And so that there are, uh, there are some sociologists, some people begin to say that, that, that the pressure of this new kind of cultural standard that's coming out of the rapid hip hop community may, may, I emphasize the word may, may be just as much as a barrier as racism. And that's, and that's really sad. One of, one of the things I think um, I'll, I'll just be very clear, I, some, some of you could probably do a Google search and look up uh, Obama and Carson and find out that I've endorsed him um, for president. Um, and one of the reasons, and I think the main reason, has very little to do with his Harvard law degree and all of the other things that uh, are part of his resume for being president. Uh, quite frankly, my understanding of American history is you don't need to be overly bright. You don't need a, in fact, a Harvard degree is, uh, is, is prob probably gets you disqualified from being seriously considered uh, these days for, for president. Um, you know, Lyndon Johnson came from a small teacher's college in, in Texas. And, and uh, you know, just, just looking through the group, um, uh, actually, George Bush is one of the more well-educated, although I don't think the education took very well. But, um, but that's just not where I see the dilemma is at, at the present. I think that the crucial problem we face in the world and in this society, and I think it becomes so apparent to me as I travel around the world and see it in every single country, is how do we get along? Uh, that uh, it, the way in which the world has solved that problem in the past is to have a hierarchy. Mm -hmm. that's, what, that's what the Jim Crow system was. That's what colonialism is. It, it is a hierarchy of we're on top, you're on the bottom, and you may fight that, but that's the reality of the world, and that's the, the social order, and that's what gives order to the world. And I think that what we're in now is a, a place in human history where we're beyond colonialism, we're beyond apartheid, we're beyond Jim Crow. So those classic systems of oppression are now consigned to the history books. But people aren't free. And but furthermore, they are together in very close proximity. The people who were colonized in 1950 are now living in Brussels, are now living in Amsterdam and Paris and London. Um, they are living in this country. And therefore, the need to find some way of creating a peaceful social order in the mix of diversity is the great problem of the 21st century. And it can't be solved by the classical answers. We're not going to go back to slavery. We're not going to go back to uh, the Jim Crow system or apartheid or any of those things because, quite frankly, because no one will, we won't allow it to happen. So what is going to be put in its place? Well, there is this ideal called equality. I don't think it's going to it'll probably take another century before we even get close to that ideal. Right now, the world is moving more farther apart rather than closer together in terms of, of real equality, in terms of economics and, and resources. So there has to be some way of understanding that problem and dealing with it. 
I don't think that most leaders, most people running for president have a clue about the solution to that problem. I don't even think they know that that is the major problem of the century. Um, I think that one thing I sense from reading Obama's story is that in his life story, he's engaged with that problem, that problem of diversity and how do we, how do we deal with it. I don't know if he has any answers, but you can't even get close to the answer unless you know what the question is. And I think that that's the only thing that gives, gives me some hope uh, that perhaps uh, he can do that. Um, I'm not one who feels that the president is going to make the world better. Um, I think that it, the president can make the world a lot worse. And that's what the next election is about. It, it's, it's whether we'll have somebody who will make it worse as opposed to at least somebody who knows that you've got to move in a different direction. Um, that's a kind of two cheers <laughs> for Obama. <laughs> Can I just say, uh, in response to me, you're from South Carolina? Yeah. You might be interested. I was like, that just. I don't know whether it's the Oprah factor or the Obama factor or both, but the Obama-Oprah campaign had originally had to try to find a venue large enough and they found some place where it could accommodate 18,000 people. And they found out that the demand for, as I said, whether it was Oprah or Oprah and Obama, was so great that they now have taken the stadium. I guess the University of South Carolina that holds 80,000 people. <laughs> because the demand is so great. Now, I cannot believe yeah. that all of those people are there are black. I cannot believe that everybody wanting to get in that stadium is like maybe the majority of them. But that says something. There is something new going on with all due respect to the person who said, well, I'm not, I can never vote for Hillary, but I'm never going to vote for a nigger. I heard what you said. Mm -hmm. There is something new. Uh, 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 there is something new. And this, this I guess I want to say something about, if I can, about Martin King, Martin Luther King Jr. Because you know, uh, early on, uh, he said and believed so deeply <coughs> that even, even segregation, even white racism, <coughs> that there was a that there was a core of decency uh, in every white racist. Okay, that if they were touched. Specifically, if they could see the consequences of their racism before them, mm. that they would change. And I think that the Obama campaign is a, it's an interesting phenomenon. We don't quite know what it is, but I think he is touching on something when he can go to. I mean, I've been to Iowa. I know very. I know Iowa very well. Okay, when he can be reaching and touching the people in Iowa. And he could be reaching and touching the people in New Hampshire, the first we have New Hampshire, Vermont, the first no black people. Okay. Okay. There is something new going on. Any final comments? Well, one of the things that um, I, I definitely hope um, from this class um, that you can take away, if there is an African American history, One of the things I would say about to all of you is that everyone in this class is African American. If you grew up in this society, you are deeply infected with this culture <laughs> called African American culture. Of course, everyone in this class is also European American. And so that voyage of, of self-discovery that uh, Obama writes about, which I, I do invite you to, to read the book. I think it's a very, very insightful book, um, is, is one that every person needs to take. Because I think that if you arrived in this class assuming that you were studying someone else's history, that that was a misconception 
And perhaps the best thing that you can learn is that you are studying your own history, regardless of, of your racial background. Um, and if you can take that um, lesson away, then I think the class has been a success. I, I hope to uh, see some of you maybe in the King and Gandhi class and some of you coming with me to India, which should be fun. And uh, um, as far as uh, the um, thing that you're most worried about for those of you who are taking the, the final is that uh, I like to judge people on where they end up in the class rather than how they got there. So if your final end up indicates to me that uh, you've learned a lot in the, in the class, um, then it's not going to be just average um, with the midterm. So good luck. The preceding program is copyrighted by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu.